Hey, everybody, welcome to another Friday edition of the $100 million producer panel here with me and Andrew Katie. And uh, again, man, it's just, I can't say, I, we say it every week, it just seems like these weeks are flying by when, you know, the market is just so crazy. It's like, it seems like every day flies by so fast. So how's it going on your end, Andrew? Oh, it's going, um, you know, just, you know, motivating the team, keeping everybody happy. I mean, at the end of the day, Yes, we're in a blip in the radar. You know, I one of my favorite phrases someone told me uh, last year was, you know, five, 10 years from now in our careers, this whole segment of high interest rates will simply be a dot on a chart. It'll be something we all look back and say, you remember when. And frankly, for me, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and lie. It's not, it's a challenging market, not a lot of inventory. You know, rates are just wild moving left and right. But none of those things are things I can control. What we can control is our daily activities. And so that's what I continue to focus with my team on is, is getting out there and focusing and do what you do every single day and do it well. There's so many cliches thrown around, but one of the ones that really truly hits home and everybody should focus on is, you know, don't let the uncontrollables control you and or, or, or you know, only focus on what you can control. I mean, however you want to word that phrase. And it's so true. I mean, look at it this way. Rates are up, but they're up for everybody, not just you. You know, so if you're watching this and you're down in the dumps about where rates have been the last week, hey, your competition's in the same boat. And in fact, most of your competition's in a worse boat than you are with rates. So it's like just just focus on the job at hand. And and you know, if you if you dwell on the uncontrollables. Anything in life that you do that with, whether it's your job or your personal life, you're in find yourself kind of miserable most of the time and always chasing, it, and always chasing it, something that's not there. Yeah. And you're also going to find yourself in, in a company of a bunch of other people. And, and that's just the reality of it. Misery loves company. So you're going to find a whole bunch of people that are going to be miserable with you. But just think about the opposite side of that. You know, how many loan originators right now are, have this negative Nancy attitude. I'm in the Facebook groups. I see the posts. It's ridiculous. What if you were one out of the 10 or one out of the 20 or maybe one out of the 100 that they didn't wake up in the morning and be like, woe is me. This job sucks. The market sucks. Screw Jerome Powell. What if you just woke up in the morning and were like, you know what? It is what it is. I'm going to call extra people today. I'm going to dive in deeper. I've got, you know, I've got one of my loan officers right now is 27 pre-approved buyers. Like wake up in the morning, call every single pre-approved buyer every single week. Talk to them, coach them, guide them. We're going to be so far ahead of the pack, just pushing past the negativity right now. Oh, absolutely. And um, it's just, it's like, you know, like yesterday I gave a speech at the Windsor event about um, top producers are made in down markets. And I, tro I wholeheartedly believe that. I mean, a lot of you, most of the people watching this probably weren't around 2008. I mean, a handful were, you know, um, I was, unfortunately. Um, but 2008, for as miserable as it was, and as big as a kick in the backside as it was to me for about 18 months, and I'm telling you, it was a miserable 18 months. I won't lie. It made my career because I chose the path of just, I'm going to win at this no matter what it takes. And there was a lot of really, really tough, tough months in that 18 period, 18 month period. But I came out of it way ahead of most of my competition because I didn't let it get me down. I mean, I, I can't say I didn't wake up some mornings a little bit frustrated and just aggravated. But overall, I kept the attitude up and I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And next thing you know, it's like I get to late 2009. I'm like, wow, things are really clicking now, you know, and and it just built and built and built. And, that, you know, and it, it built into a pretty successful originating career I had after that. Yeah. And, you know, I just got back from West Palm Beach uh, where we did Elevate to Dominate. Uh, Barry Habib was the guest speaker. And I figured I want to digest my thoughts really in depth on this and make a ton of notes. And I, for next week's $100 million producer is going to be all about this event. But the reality of it is, is that you're dead right. This is the market. And one of the key points that that is my takeaway is at times like this, there's so many people that right now are burying their head in the sand. Analysis paralysis. They simply are stuck. They don't know what to do next. They wake up with fear. They go to bed with fear. 
But if you can separate yourself from the pack, become an advisor, and truly begin to advise your clients and advise your real estate agents, the beautiful thing right now is real estate agents aren't super busy. So if you want to go out and build relationships, now is your time. But it's going to take that advisor mentality. It's going to take going to the next level, not just, hey, Mr. Realtor, it's Johnny. Can I get your business? That's not going to work. But what if you actually sat down and you and you talked about, you know, purchase um, purchase consolidation loans and offered to go on listing appointments with your real estate agents? Hey, you got this seller who's got a 3% interest rate mortgage. This is one of the things Barry really went into was, was purchase consolidation loans. And it's, hey, you've got the 3% mortgage. You know, this seller doesn't want to list their home. Hey, why don't you bring me along on your listing appointment? I'll sit down with the seller and I'll work out what their blend rate is of all their debt and see if we can structure, because they have so much equity, the ability to pay off some debts and end up in the home of their dreams for probably the same monthly payments overall that they're paying right now. And so getting out there and, and getting creative Now's the opportunity to build big, big relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the realtors that you give value to during this time are the ones that are going to stick with you when the times are easier, you know, and uh, again, there's that I've seen numerous articles. I think we touched on this last week about the two and 3% golden handcuffs that are around homeowners risk. And a lot of them either won't sell or they're thinking, well, I'll sell, but I'm going to, rent this old place out because it's such a low rate. And those are the ones that, you know, you can advise with your listing agents and say, you know, think this through, you know, not everybody should be a landlord. You know, um, I've owned rental properties and I don't own any currently as we speak, but I've owned many throughout the years and I'm always looking for that next big deal, which I haven't been able to find lately, but you know, it's not for everybody. And you know, you, you have to have a thick skin to be a, a landlord, in my opinion. So a lot of these people there are saying, well, I'll just rent my place out and not sell it. No, we, we need these people educated on what it means to be a landlord because we need that inventory back in the market. And yeah. you know, it, it, so it, you've got to be an advisor in every aspect of this business, not just yeah. from the rate standpoint, but from helping the listing agent out. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, accidental landlords is what this Forbes article called it. You know, everybody's becoming accidental landlords. And there's a big problem with that because, you know, investors, they are emotionless about the property they're buying. This one cash flows, buy it. This one doesn't, don't buy it. If you get landlord, if you get a primary residence that they're converting to a rental just because it makes financial sense, there's so much emotion tied up in that primary residence. They're going to make themselves so miserable nine out of 10 times of, you know, hey, you know, I have so many memories of my with me and my dog on that back porch. And then they go check on it. And the, the renter has messed up this. It has messed up that. This isn't just an emotionless transaction. So you're dead right. A lot of people aren't cut out to be landlords. A lot of people aren't cut out to rent out their former primary residence where they've built five, six, seven, 10 years of memories. Yeah. Yeah. I've only rent. I mean, I've only rented one house that I actually lived in. That goes back many years ago, but my wife is a good example. Evie wouldn't, if we rented this place out we're in now, she would be a mess wanting to know who was in there. Do we really want, and like you, you know, you, you can't look at, if you have three people looking to lease your place, you can't look at it and say, oh, they look like a nicer family. You can't do that. You're, you're violating many laws when you, pick and choose the way people look. And I don't mean that in any kind of a bad racial way or anything like that. Just, you know, it's why I don't know. And I think it's not really exactly legal now. A lot of realtors don't even like to use them. Those those com those comfort letters or whatever, where you put a picture right. of the family and it says, my family and my two young kids want to occupy your house. That's why we want to buy your house. I mean, those aren't really legal because, you know, or they, or they walk a fine line because in this, Sue happy world win. I mean, you got to be careful with that. And that, that's why you have to take the emotion out. And again, my wife would be a terrible landlord. She would be like wanting to drive by the place every week. And oh my God, they, they took a plant out. That that was a plant that me and you bought together on this date. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't even yeah, and, and my wife is, that, you know, 
my wife is exactly the same. You know, I have I have neighbors behind me and I'm so envious of them because the, all they do is buy a home. They build a home. They live in it for eight months and sell it. And they just they just cycle this done this in my neighborhood at least a half dozen times now. And they've made great money doing it. But typical homeowners are emotional about properties. Investors on their rental properties or not. So I think there's a whole education side of this business that needs to be addressed on that. The whole consolidate debt consolidation through a purchase. We all know what debt consolidation refis are, but BlackRock or Black Knight came out and said the average tappable equity is $185,000 per home right now in America. There's so many people that are sitting on massive debt that they could pay off and you know, credit card interest rates, 24% almost on the average now. Like there's so many opportunities, but it's like we talked about last week. You got to put the work in. There is no free lunch right now. No. And unfortunately, though, that's not how most people think. You know, most people are always looking for that easy home run that they can hit, you know, whether it be selling their properties or making a buck off of renting it. Or, you know, I, um, I try to stay off of Reddit, but there's a Reddit thing in there, Wall Street Bets. And if you go, you want a good laugh, go into Wall Street Bets on Reddit and read these guys that are convinced that Bed Bath & Beyond that's in bankruptcy and closing all their stores down, they're convinced that they're all going to be able to retire from their jobs in six months because they think that that 12 cent stock is going to go to 1200. I don't know where they're getting this from. But it's that mentality that we work around. And that's why there's so many people out there, so much credit card debt that you could do this for, because I, I hate to say it, but probably over 50% of society out there, they're always thinking the next home runs around the corner, the next saviors around the corner, and it's not. And they're laden in credit card debt. They're never going to get ahead. And that's our job to go out there and show them, hey, get off of the Wall Street bets, quit thinking you're going to win the lottery, and let's make some financial sense out of your situation. You've got a bunch of equity. Let's restructure it. And let's, let's teach you how to, how to win in life without a miracle. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of loan officers, you know, oh. thinking the next shiny object, the next click funnel, that is going to be the thing. Oh, if I become a life insurance agent as well, and I can offer life insurance to my client, like, no, just go do the work. Like just go do extra work. And, and get it done. But you bring up an interesting point, and it's it's something I've had conversations with my kids about. And I think there's a huge lack of just financial education in the younger generations, millennials and younger. You know, when, when you and I graduated high school, we knew that we were either A, going to go to college, get a degree and get a job, or we were going to go out and we were going to work our rear ends off and we were going to find a way to grow within a business we we either started or like those were our options. My kids graduating high school now, they have this whole world of social media influencers, this whole feed coming at them of, of teenagers that are making millions of dollars by posting on TikTok and Instagram. And there's this whole psychological disconnect that that could be people's normal. When we were growing up, there was no option. Like you either worked hard or you went to college or you started a business. Like that's what you did. And so I think the the education side of our careers geared towards younger buyers really needs to kick into high gear. Doing, you know, financial literacy classes, like go out and begin to teach what it means to build wealth through homeownership. It's really sad because my, my kids, my my youngest, my, my stepson's 23 now. So it's been a few years since he was in school. But I can remember, you know, you, you, you know, they, they get the, they get they, they at the end of the school year, then they get the packet to start choosing their school classes for the next year or, or shortly thereafter. Right. I don't remember in all all the years of like doing that with my kids, my 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 daughter, who is a lot older than my stepson, who's younger. I don't remember ever seeing a true financial literacy class like, you know, algebra two and trigonometry. And, you know, those are great if you're going into engineering. I'm in the financial business for the last 30 plus years, 27 of it in mortgages. I don't think I've ever really used any of that algebra or anything else for what I do. You know, I mean, and, and I get it. It's, 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 it's absolutely needed if you're going to go into engineering or you're going into like a pharmacy chemist or something like that, you know. But I think every single school out there should have a mandatory financial literacy class that you have to take and you have to pass. I mean, 
we would be so much better off if they went through two semesters of financial literacy instead of two semesters of i don't know world history i mean great or, great or you know descriptions you know i'd rather know about balancing a checkbook than knowing who king tut was you know three thousand agreed years ago. and and what if what if you as a loan originator said hey you know what i'm going to meld myself into my community i'm going to reach out to my local school districts and I'm going to offer to come in and teach yeah. a, a one hour, the power of home ownership to the senior class at every high school within a hundred mile radius of me, build out an hour long presentation, talk about buying multifamily properties with three and a half percent down, living in one unit for a year, turning it into a rental and walk down that road. Like, do you realize the inroads you'd make with your community? And you may be like, well, 18 year olds aren't going to buy homes, but guess who does? Their parents. And yeah. when Johnny comes home from high school and he is amped and starts sitting his dad down and saying, oh my gosh, like, as soon as I can save money, I'm buying this house. I'm going to do this. I'm going to flip it. I'm going to create four units of rental properties. Johnny's dad's going to be like, where'd you hear that from? Oh, here's his business card. You don't think you would you would meld into your community and get a absolute monster amount of business from just going out teaching financial literacy? Oh yeah, or, who's stopping you? Like or, pick or the you phone could, up, calls. Yeah. Or you could even do it like you know you could do the first one with the kids and then have a, a another one where they invite their parents in with them or something just so the parents can see what you're teaching them. Like you said though, Johnny will go home and talk to his parents and it will create more or. You know, again, I'm a, I'm getting a little late in my career, but you know, if you're a young originator that have two years in the business, and you see a good twenty years down the road. Johnny may be the one calling you in seven or eight years. You know, I mean, I, I still get referrals from people I closed ten years ago. I mean, people, if you if you mark if you make an impression on them, they will remember you, and they will come back to you when they're ready. You know. And, oh, I got couldn't agree more. And, you know, cr create a Facebook group, you know, um, you know, homeowner, ho homeownership for, for late teens, early twenties, create a Facebook group, put a QR code up at the bottom of your presentation and be like, Hey, join into this. I'm going to continue to drop information for you guys. Get a group of over the four years, get a group of 30,000 people that you've presented to into a Facebook group that you can exclusively market to. Like this stuff isn't hard, but it takes work and it takes actually doing it like there, there's so much opportunity out there. I mean, think about it this way. If you're target demographics, and I know we don't target by age because we can't do that. But if you're, if you are pushing marketing towards reverse mortgages, for instance, 62 years old or older, you're very likely going after an audience that has one, maybe two home purchases or refinances left in their life. However, if your target audience is high school seniors, you, you, you got probably 12 to 13 lifetime transactions out of, out of these people as they, as they mature into adulthood. Like I'm seeing more and more and more and more applications coming in with people that were born in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. Like we're not far away from high school seniors going in and making it and saying, Hey, I want to buy this home. Like there's a, there's a kid who just bought a home in Rosemary Beach, 18 years old, just bought a $6.8 million home. Jesus. At 18. Wow. Like, why not? So if, we're, if, if that market's out there, go capture it. Yeah. You know, it's funny, but the um, I know the NFL does it. I think all the sports teams do it now. But I know the NFL does it for sure. When those rookies come out of, out of the draft, they are required to take a, a financial class. The NFL is making them do that now because the NFL realized they had a PR nightmare on their hands. A few, this goes back a few years, but you had all these guys from the seventies and early eighties that were just broken down, you know, physically, they couldn't really work. They were just a mess from back then. The, you know, the, 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 the training wasn't as well. So a lot of these guys came out with a lot of bad physical ailments and they were flat busted broke. I mean, you'd, you'd see these news stories of, you know, the star running back for whoever is now in a homeless shelter, you know, because they pissed away all their money with Lamborghinis and, and private jets and all that. So I know the NFL is doing it. It's probably all the sports leagues now, but they are making these guys sit through two classes. One's a financial literacy class 
And the other one is a class on not getting caught up with bad people. I don't know what the word is that, what they call it, but it's basically saying, hey, you guys stay away from the groupies that are looking to, you know, get child support. And, you know, but they make these guys take those classes because they realize that they were doing them a disservice when they hand a 22 year old kid three million dollars a year. You know, agreed. There's a um, there's a video Grant Cardone did. I'm not a huge Grant Cardone fan. That's not like, you know, I'm not a 10 X or. Uh, but there's one particular video he did that that I've probably watched 20 times where he talks about, he specifically says, I'm talking to you musicians and you ball players. And he said, you've got to understand your voice as a musician is probably only going to last you eight to 10 years before you burn it out. Ball players, you're, you're, you're five years, maybe seven if you're really, really exceptional. And he basically goes on to say in this video, you don't spend any of your earned income to buy things. You buy what you do with your earned income is you create passive income and then you start using your passive income to buy your things. And, and the, the video premise is so freaking good. But going back to my earlier topic, so we talk about high schools. What about colleges? They don't do it either. What about the graduating class of a college? Being able to go in as a financial expert and go in and talk to them about their next stages. You don't think college administration would love to have someone who's an expert in a field come in, speak to their graduating class for 30 minutes and talk to them about financial literacy and the power of homeownership and how it can change their future. And that crowd of people may be only two years away or one year away from buying a home. Like there's so much opportunity if we just go capture it. You know what? I think we've created our next big project. Maybe Andrew, I think maybe it's time for me and you to get out there and hit the colleges and do a, uh, you mortgage financial literacy thing and bring along some people and make a dude. I am. I, I, we're, we're brewing this as we go. So now, like viewers here, you guys get to see how like these ideas are formed. Like, why wouldn't we start putting together this and and hitting up colleges all across the country? Bring our local loan office in and just go teach financial literacy. No, I'm all for it. I think that's and you know, the colleges especially. They're always bringing in speakers for things. I mean, you know, you hear about the controversial ones, you know, the the conservative speaker that gets picketed by the liberal students and vice versa and all that. But it's the truth. Like there's so many groups on college campuses that then brings people in. And it's just a matter of reaching out and finding the right groups or even the administrators and saying, hey, you know, we don't want any money for this. You know, yeah, you know, such and such speakers come in and get paid to do it. We're going to come in and do this for free. We're going to give you our time. We're going to do a presentation to the students that want to be there. And they're going to walk away from it, understanding financial literacy better. And we're not asking anything in return for it. I mean, I would think that most college campuses would be all over that unless they, you know, unless they had something like with Rocket or one of them big companies that have their stuff all over the place, you know, but especially the smaller colleges, the, 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 those are the ones you do, do probably do even better in, but I, I could see this turning into something special for us uh, going forward. Yeah. I, I definitely think uh, we're going to be having a lot of conversations concerning this topic. And it's one of my core pillars on my team. We're about communication and education. Education, I've always felt, is the biggest lacking piece in the mortgage industry. So many people are just order takers. They sit behind a desk, the phone rings, they answer it. Here's your interest rate. Here's your loan. There's no education. Hey, here's why I'm putting you in an FHA loan. There's base, just base level education. Hey, here's why. Here's the scenario. Let's look at other options and why they don't work for you. Become an educator on a base level, but become an educator on social media towards your real estate agents. Become an educator teaching lunch and learns, and then expand it out and become an educator at college campuses, at high schools, at community events, like how many big community events are held? What about if you want to talk about a, an entire subsect would be VFWs going in and teaching financial literacy and VA home loans at, at VFWs and, and for veteran charters. Like there's so many options and so many opportunities. Yeah, that truly is. And, 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 and if we, if, if us and our viewers don't get after and do it, you know, who is already doing this is Dave Ramsey. And he's giving such horrible, 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 horrible. I have to add a few more in there. Advice. I mean, I, I, I can't. You know, if you take the, yeah, I know, I, I just, it makes me want to vomit. But if you, if you take what Dave Ramsey does and you simplify it down and you can say, 
the guy's doing a great service by teaching people to stay out of debt. But then he can't hand, he can't stop there. And anybody that's watching this that hasn't listened to Dave Ramsey, you probably have because he's one of the most hated men in the mortgage business next to Jerome Powell right now. Um, he <laughs> and a few other feds. Um, he literally tells people you don't need a credit score. He tells people you never need a credit card for emergencies. You never need anything. And then he's pushing no credit score loans through his own mortgage company. Was it Churchill Mortgage? I think it's the name of it or something. No mortgage. So he's got a hidden agenda there that is really not, it's, 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 it's smoke and mirrors, but underneath it all, the, 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 the message that comes through the loudest is I'm going to teach people how to be financially literate and not get involved in debt. But then he takes it way off the left hand rails. So yeah. And, and debt and debt can be a wonderful tool, like, yes, yes. especially when interest rates are low. Again, go back to the golden handcuffs. Like <laughs> it, Inflation's at ten at eight percent, and my mortgage is at three percent. There's a five percent on the delta on that. So, like, there, there's there's points where debt is a really really great tool for people, and I think he's way off base on it. Um, like, he doesn't understand the concept of how PMI works. You know, never buy a home with less than twenty percent down. Well, if you've got an eight hundred credit score, you're putting fifteen percent down. Your PMI is probably going to be like sixteen dollars a month. Yeah. Like, like, please. Like no, you're it, right. He, he just he, he takes it way. He just again. I I don't. I used to think he didn't understand it, but now what I think it is is he fully understands it, and he preaches bad advice to drive business to his businesses where he makes money off of people. You know, and imagine that concept. Yeah, and, and and the bottom and the problem is is this. He lumps debt in one definition. He all debt in his eyes is the same, and it's all bad. And there's different levels. I mean, credit card debt that you carry a balance on, there's never a good reason to carry a balance on a 22% credit card. There just is not. You know, now you may have to because of your financial situation. Credit card debt's bad debt. You know, mortgage debt can be very good debt in the right ways. I mean, me personally, I could have put, I could have paid cash for the house we're in. I put a decent amount down, but I also have a 2.625 rate. I will. I'm not paying extra on my mortgage every month. In the past, I did back when I had a much higher rate on my old house. But on this house, I'm paying the minimum payment every month. Just And, and I will for a long time because I can utilize that 2.625 money in other places. I mean, heck, I just put some money into a one month CD, a one month CD. And I got 4.9% on a one month CD. You know, yeah, I've, I've been rolling money. investments through the one month treasuries, just cycling them. And it's... Yeah. I mean, stupid. That's an example of good debt. Instead of me paying an extra 10 grand on my month on my mortgage this month, I'll put that 10 grand in a CD for the next month, or maybe three months CD at five and a quarter or whatever it was. You know, I mean, it's it's outpacing my my mortgage debt. So those are but Dave Ramsey doesn't see it that way. He sees all all debts as bad debt. And yeah, and, and you know, I, I don't want to go too far on a Dave Ramsey tangent, yeah. but we're passionate about it. I mean, like my 18-year-old daughter has an 800 credit score. Because I've added her as an authorized user on cards that I have a very long standing, but she uses her card religiously. Why? Because if she used her debit card and that card was compromised, then her physical money has been removed from her account. Whereas every charge she does hits her Capital One card. Now she goes in every Friday and pays the balance in full every Friday. It's like just religious, like Friday morning, you sign in, whatever the balance is, you pay it. You never charge more than you have in your account basic you know principles behind it but it's a whole level of protection for her that if for some reason that card's compromised her money's still in her bank account yeah we can work with the credit card company but she isn't out the money in the meantime yeah. I, can, I have a debit card in my wallet only for emergencies if i need full cash out of an atm you know same, same i thing. never use that debit card anywhere but an atm machine my, my whole goal with my checking account is to have the least amount of transactions possible. If I can charge any of my bills to my credit card, everything, all I want to see is my house payment come out per month and my credit card payoff statement per week. Like that's the only charges I want to see coming out of my checking account. Yeah. 
The same here. I mean, I have a couple bills that will not charge to a credit card without like a 5% penalty, like my HOA. It has to be a direct withdrawal out of my checking account. I think that's it. I think it's my HOA and my water bills, the only two that come out of my checking account because they make me do it or they penalize me for using a credit card. Everything else is through American Express. I mean, yeah. you know, and I have a Capital One too because not everybody takes American Express. But, you know, it's, and not only that, but, you know, I build up a ton of airline miles with American Express on my Delta card. So, and exactly. for me, that's important as much as I travel. So, hit our 30 minutes already. Oh, wow. Look at yeah, that. Go bad. The weeks go by, the 30 minutes go by. It's like, before we know, it, we're both going to be sitting here like elderly old men still talking. <laughs> <laughs> I love well, join I'm us next week. You are. <laughs> yeah, join us next week. We're going to break down uh, the whole Elevate to Dominate event. Um, I want to really gather my thoughts, put some notes down, and and have a whole bunch of information from that event. I think Todd's going to do the same from his time that he spent at Windsor. And then we will be back with you next Friday, and we'll be hashing it all out. Absolutely. Everybody have a great holiday weekend coming up. And remember, let your realtors know. It might be Memorial Day weekend, but hey, you guys work when they work and get out there and hustle. Absolutely. Answer your damn phone. Answer your damn phone. That's it, buddy. All right. Everybody have a good one.